Welcome to this first video about the structure and function of antibodies. I'm going to use a protracted and somewhat forced analogy to help illustrate what antibodies do and how they do it. Let's say that the inside of your body is like the yard around your house, and the outside is the public thoroughfare. As we know, the outside is populated by a number of nefarious microbes, like this extracellular bacterium. Here he is, Grr, and he's quite evil. And let's say his name is uh, Gary. This is Aunt, uh, Gary the microbe. And he's got some cell surface proteins here. And Gary would just love to infiltrate into my yard and there he would find a nice home with plenty of food and a protected environment in which to proliferate. This would be extraordinarily bad for me, of course. That would constitute an infection. So how do I prevent that from happening? Or if it should happen, how do I stop that? The first preventive measure is to create a barrier, like a fence for my yard. And that is composed of these cells, which are all bound together by tight junctions, and this is the mucosal layer, mucosa. It's called that because it not only constitutes a physical barrier of epithelial cells, but because these cells can produce this sticky green mucus, which acts like a chemical barrier. And in fact, in many cases, the mucus contains antimicrobial peptides that function in a way like the body's own antibiotics, poisoning Gary should he try and penetrate through that layer of mucus. And indeed, this system is very effective in preventing a number of infections. But for the sake of discussion, let's say that Gary, this bacterium, somehow circumvents or evades my defenses and gains access to my yard. Here he is. happy, still evil, Grr. and now instead of working on the preventive system, it's the job of my immune system to respond and prevent Gary from causing significant damage to my body. How is it going to do that? Well, among the many mechanisms available to the immune system. One of the most important is the production of antibodies, which I like to think of as, try a different color here, molecular attack dogs. Each dog has a long tail here, and then two arms with very specific claws at the end. Remember, the immune system works by shape, molecular shape. So in order to function properly, the claws of this attack dog have to match some structure on Gary in order to grab onto him. And grabbing onto him, like sinking its claws into Gary's leg, for example, is going to cause three things to occur. One is that there may be damage to Gary's cell membrane by mechanisms that hopefully we'll discuss in a future video. Here are some holes in Gary's membrane. Secondly, the binding of these antibodies to Gary's external structure may slow him down. If, for example, some of these proteins are flagellar structures that allow Gary to be motile, they may be impeded from functioning properly and thereby impede Gary from progressing deeper into my tissues. Third, and most importantly, the cells of the immune system, like the security guards of my yard, are equipped with cell surface receptors for antibody tails. And by means of these antibody tails, a cell of the immune system can grab onto this microbe sort of like using the antibody attack dogs as a pair of tongs. And there may be more than two that bind, of course. And then 
having bound Gary engulf him or release chemicals like the immune system's version of pepper spray that impair or destroy uh, this bacterium. So let's say, let's try another color there. Let's take a closer look at these antibody dogs. So each dog, as I mentioned, has a long tail that is called the FC portion because it's crystallizable. And then these two arms with claws on the end. And this portion, the arms and the claws, is called the fragment that has the antigen binding capacity. Now imagine that the dogs running around your yard are actually in five different species. And the species of the dog is determined by the structure of this FC portion. And that's called the isotype of the antibody. Isotype is telling you what species of the dog it is. And there are five such species. Antibodies, by the way, antibodies are sometimes abbreviated ABs. And that term is synonymous with another you'll encounter called immunoglobulin. Immuno, of or pertaining to this immune system, globulin, which means protein, and those are sometimes abbreviated Ig. So uh, antibodies and immunoglobulins are synonymous, and each one of these species or isotypes is designated by Ig and then a letter. And those letters are G, M, A, D, and E. And depending on what isotype this a given antibody molecule is, that will determine its function. Of course, what it binds to, Gary or some other microbe, is determined by the clause. So you could have an IgE that binds onto Gary, you could have an IgG that binds onto Gary, or you could have two IgGs, one that binds onto Gary and one that binds onto a completely different invader. Why? Because, let's say there's a separate bacterium that has a different structure from Gary, he's equally evil, but he has different cell surface proteins or other structures. We'll call this one Warren. And it's important to appreciate that the Gary antibody in green here is completely ineffective for binding to Warren. So if I had a dog in my yard, it would be a dog that basically had just the right shaped claws to bind onto Gary, and it was trained to find and neutralize Gary. But if Warren sneaks in, that anti-Gary antibody is completely useless. So I have to have another antibody against Warren. Here we'll put the anti-Warren antibody, which is waiting for Warren to try and sneak in, and then it will neutralize Warren. So these different isotypes are capable of different functions. IgE, so this is sort of like golden retrievers, Rottweilers, German shepherds, poodles, wiener dogs. IgE, the poodles, though the wiener dogs, fights parasites. And it's not clear why this is helpful or adaptive, but IgE also helps produce allergic reactions or allergies. We'll discuss the mechanism of that in a subsequent video. IgD is a little bit of a mystery. It seems to be involved in the development of some cells, but not entirely clear that it protects us against a particular type of invader. The three most important species or isotypes for defense against infection are IgA, IgM, and IgG. IgG. IgA is like the German Shepherds. It's actually not one but two antibody dogs tied together by the tail and secreted at the surface of the body like the lining of the gut or the lining of the respiratory system and there it can actually bind onto invaders like Warren for example before they pass through the mucosal layer so they're very effective because they're preventive. IgM IgM is like a 
pack of vicious Rottweilers, not one or two, but no less than five antibodies, all bound together by the tail. And while very effective in attacking an invader, IgM doesn't last very long. In fact, clinically, having a measurable concentration of IgM against a particular target is considered indicative of an acute or recent infection. And after a, a few days or a week or two, IgM tends to resolve. That's in contrast to IgG, which is like our faithful golden retriever. And IgG is a single antibody, but unlike IgM, even though individual molecules might only last a few weeks, the cells that produce IgG, called plasma cells, can be very, very long-lived. In fact, they can survive and maintain concentrations of IgG that defend our body against a given invader for decades, or maybe even our whole lifetime. In fact, it's the purpose, the goal of all vaccination, at least the useful vaccines that we have, in large measure, to induce the production of reasonable, meaningful concentrations of IgG that will last us for very long times. In a subsequent video, we'll talk more about how antibodies do what they do. See you in the next video.